Hello and welcome to Ember's Reading Room. You didn't think we forgot about my bedtime book of two minute stories, did you? Why do you think we put episode 50 on the weekend? <laughs> uh, we don't want to interfere with your story groove. It feels like we have a good thing going here. So let's continue with my bedtime book of two minute stories edited by Rosemary Garland and illustrated by Tony Escott and Sally Wellman. Today's three stories are Dancing Pins by Rosemary Garland, The Grumpy Red Bus by Margaret Connor, and Dumpling the Cuddly Hedgehog by Anna Webb. A cuddly hedgehog? Mm, yeah, they actually are kind of nice. We've gone to the zoo and touched the hedgehog before. Dancing Pins. Simon's auntie owned a little dress shop in the high street, and sometimes mother left Simon with his auntie while she went to do her shopping. Simon loved helping auntie, but the thing he liked best was when auntie made the pins dance. Make the pins dance and stand up, he used to say, and auntie would put some pins on a piece of paper. Then she moved her hand under the paper, and all the pins jumped up and moved about all over the paper. But when Simon put his hand under the paper, the pins would not dance for him. One day, Simon sat and watched as Auntie was shortening a dress for a lady. It was a beautiful dress, but it was much too long. The lady stood very still and very straight. Auntie knelt down and began to pin up the dress. She had a big, fat pincushion strapped to her wrist like a bracelet where she kept the pins. Auntie's mouth was full of pins, too. When Auntie talked, Simon hoped and hoped she would not swallow any pins. On the table behind, there was a box full of pins, too, and there were pins on the floor, too. In fact, there were pins everywhere. There, said Auntie in a funny voice, because her mouth was full of pins. Walk over there and let's see if the hem is even. Auntie got up quickly and knocked the box of pins off the table. They spilled all over the carpet. I'll pick them up, said Simon and he started picking them up one by one. It was such a long job. Auntie was too busy with the lady to think about the pins. But when the lady had gone out of the shop, Auntie said, I've got a much quicker way of picking up pins. Look, use this. And she held out a huge magnet. Just run this along the carpet and it will even pick up the ones that you cannot see. It was such fun. The pins jumped to the magnet and all bunched together at the end of it. He soon picked up all the pins. Now we pull them off the magnet and pop them back in the box, said Auntie. Is that how you make the pins dance? asked Simon. He suddenly understood how Auntie had made them dance. Yes, you've discovered the secret at last, Auntie laughed. Simon spent the rest of the morning picking up pins in all sorts of corners of the shop and at the back of Auntie's needle and cotton cupboard. It was such fun. He went round the shop to find out what else the magnet would pull towards it. The magnet hung from the door handle, and it was even strong enough to pull Auntie's scissors across the table. He soon found that the magnet would not pull anything but iron. Try pulling this along, said Auntie, and she took a ring off her finger. It doesn't work, said Simon. That's because the ring is made of real gold, said Auntie. When it was time to go home, Simon showed Mother the huge magnet. Simon has been such a good boy this morning, said Auntie. He has picked up all the pins all over the floor. I think he should be rewarded for his work. There you are, she said, and she gave Simon the magnet as a reward. Oh, thank you, Auntie, said Simon. But you must bring it every time you come and pick up my pins, said Auntie. Yes, and I'll make the pins dance for you, said Simon. Oh, that was a cute little story. And I've seen those bracelet pin cushions. I think my grandmother had one. Yeah, I've seen a lot of people use them, actually. I've seen various different sizes and various different types. Like, for instance, instead of a pin cushion, it's actually a magnet itself. So it's like a sheet you wrap around your arm and it's magnetized and the pins just stick to it. Ah, uh, magnetism. Actually, kind of a smart trick to drag the magnet along the ground like that. To pick up all the pins. And the art's nice. And it's that yellow with the black outlines again. 
Though it's kind of interesting, the boy looks slightly, at least the face looks slightly different in the two shots. It's not just because of the angle, I think the hair is rendered slightly different on one side. Like there's this shine here that's kind of making it look awkward on the left hand page. Though Auntie looks pretty good. She looks, oh wait, no, aunties are sisters, or, you know, close relatives that way. I was going to say, she looks kind of young for, oh no wait. She's an aunt, so she could be an older or younger sibling to either Simon's mother or father. Probably mother, considering mother brings Simon to the shop. And the art is nice. It's definitely that outlined slash filled in with the yellow style. Oh look, there's a poem on this page. <laughs> the Wonder of Nature Flowers grow all by themselves, without the help of fairies or elves. Plants and food the farmer sows. What makes them tasty? Nobody knows. The forest grows on its own. No one controls the clouds. The animals take care of themselves. <laughs> yes, yes, the MLP universe is very different. Mm -hmm. The grumpy red bus. The red bus was feeling grumpy. It was because it was raining. Now some people love the rain. They love to go splash splash through the puddles, but not the red bus. He hated splashing through the puddles and making his beautiful red coat all muddy. I'm not going out today, he said to himself when Jack, his driver, came into the garage. Come along now. What's the matter this morning? Got the grumps? asked Jack as he tried to start him up. Grrr, said the red bus, or something that sounded like that. But he had to go because Jack kept prodding and poking him about so much that he couldn't stand it in the end. That's better then, said Jack as they set off down the road. Is it then, grumbled the red bus to himself. Any moment now I shall hear that conductor ring his bell and I'll be jerked up so suddenly that my inside will rattle. And then people will start crowding inside me. And when I am full and Jim can't reach his bell, he'll stamp down his great heavy feet. It's not nice to treat me like that. How would he like to be stamped on if he were all filled up inside? And so the red bus grumbled on. He was so busy grumbling that he didn't even notice that he hadn't been stopped until they reached the town hall. Standing on the steps of the town hall were lots of children with buckets and spades. Hooray! They all shouted when they saw the red bus. Goodness, they're cheering me, cried the red bus with surprise. Then the children clambered into the red bus, still cheering and waving their buckets and spades. They climbed all over the seats and they stamped their feet on the floor. But somehow the red bus didn't seem to mind the children stamping their feet. Actually, he rather liked it, because they seemed to beat a cheerful tune. Tappity tap, tappity tap and he tried to sing a cheerful tune. Burr, 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 he sang as he sped along the road. Along the country lanes they sped, never stopping until they reached the seaside. It wasn't raining at the seaside. The sun was shining and the sky was blue. Hooray, shouted the children as they climbed out of the red bus and raced down to the beach. The children had a lovely picnic on the beach. The red bus had a picnic too with some seagulls. They brought bits of bread and had a picnic on his roof. The red bus said, stay as long as you like, but the seagulls flew away when the children came back. What strange things they brought back with them. Lumps of seaweed, winkles, and sand. They spilled some of the sand from their buckets and it trickled through some cracks in the floorboards. It tickled the red bus and he cried, ha ha. But the children didn't hear him because they were all laughing so loudly. They laughed and sang all the way home. And so did Jack and Jim and so did the little red bus. He was still singing softly to himself when at last Jack put him away in his garage. What a lovely day it had been. Kind of interesting. Told us why he was grumpy and then gave us a story about him not being grumpy. Eh, kind of reminds me of Herbie. And then the top of both pages is a um, spread with the bus on one side, on the right-hand side, and the children and what looks to be their families on the other with people meandering around the beach and someone on a boat. And I do like how 
everything's rendered and yes, Ember, I was just about to get there. I was moving on to how nicely the bus was rendered and how the seagulls were included in the spread on the top of the page. On the top of the pages. And then there's this cute little drawing in the bottom right hand corner of the first page where he's kind of like tootling along. Yeah, but it kind of looks like he's driving down the middle of the road because those are those spaces usually delineate a difference between lanes. Yeah, he, he's also kind of large too for that, if you notice. He takes up almost the entire road. And then there's on the right hand page where all the little toys that the kids brought with them. And a seashell they brought back, apparently. All very nicely rendered. In full color, I might add. I'm beginning to like the um, color artist over the um, ink and yellow artist. There's something about their style I like more. We still have more book left. You'll see if that trend continues. But now, Dumpling, the Cuddly Hedgehog. Dumpling head. Yes, yes, Odenga Atma. It sounds very funny to talk about a cuddly hedgehog when everybody knows that you can't cuddle something all covered in prickles. But Dumpling is different. Instead of having hard spines, he has soft ones. So he really is a cuddly hedgehog. When he first knew he was different, he was very unhappy. The other little hedgehogs wouldn't play with him. They would tease him and chase him and make him very miserable. It wasn't very kind of them, was it? And that's the awkward point where some kid goes, Sure it was! One day he had a long, long think, and he decided what to do. He decided to run away. Early next morning, Dumpling woke up, washed his face, and set out down the lane and through the hedge. He found beech nuts and water for breakfast, and he felt very happy indeed. All that day he was walking and playing little games by himself. The time soon passed and as the sun began to go down, he started feeling tired and to realize that he had no idea at all where he was going to sleep. He was also very hungry as well and a nice dinner was something he wanted very much. Just as the first star twinkled in the sky, Dumpling saw a little house by the side of the wood and though his tired legs were very slow, he got there somehow. Dumpling didn't know much about houses, but he did know that you had to go through the door to get inside. But he was so little, he couldn't reach the knob or the knocker. It began to get cold, and poor Dumpling just sat on the mat and looked at the door, wondering what to do. Inside the little house, Bessie Hedgehog was getting the supper ready while her sister Minnie lit the lamp and set out spoons and bowls, mugs and plates, honey and cream on the nice white tablecloth. It was cozy in the cottage. The fire burned brightly and the lamp glowed soft and yellow on the dresser and a most delicious smell came from the kitchen. Soon the supper was ready and Bessie and Minnie sat down at the table. To begin with, they each had a large bowl of warm bread and milk with lots of honey. Then a lovely apple dumpling, all soft and golden inside a light and fluffy crust. Have some more dumpling, Minnie, said Bessie. No, thank you, dear, said her sister. I've had such a big supper, I really couldn't manage another crumb. So they both had their cocoa and then sat by the fire. Minnie suddenly jumped when she heard a loud sneezy noise. Oh, Bessie, she said, have you caught a cold? No, said her sister. But I just heard a sneeze. Who could it be? So they both listened, and then they heard a loud sneeze, and this time a sob as well. Oh dear, said Bessie, there's somebody outside our front door sneezing and crying. Whoever can it be? So together they opened the door and looked out, and there, all curled up on the mat, was a tiny baby hedgehog, the smallest you have ever seen. There he was, shivering with the cold, his two little black eyes streaming with tears. He did look miserable. Oh, poor little thing, said Minnie. Come along now, don't cry any more. So she picked him up, wrapped him up in a blanket, and put him in a basket near the fire. Bessie brought him some warm bread and milk, but he didn't eat very much of that, 
So they gave him a dish of apple dumpling. And do you know what he did? He ate up all the dumpling, every bit. Then he held out the bowl for some more. Bessie and Minnie laughed, but they filled the bowl again, and soon the baby had eaten it all up. Well, I never, said Bessie. He really likes dumpling. He's eaten so much he looks a bit like a dumpling himself. I think we'll call him that until we find out his name. Dumpling loved it in the little house. Nobody ever teased him or chased him again, and they all lived happily ever after. Wouldn't his parents be worried? Yeah, just little. I, I want to I wanna hear more from this story. I, I know two minutes, but still, I, I want to know more. I want a sequel. Pretty sure there isn't one in this book. Oh, I know. It's just, like, I want to know more. Though, this is one of the really nice renderings from this artist. The characters are very nicely rendered, detailed. The grasses that you can see in some of the shots are nice. The leaves in some shots. It's, there's nice detail throughout all the shots. Nothing looks off. And Dumpling does look very fuzzy. Very cuddly. And just to clarify, we are back to the black and yellow drawings. I'm sorry, I skipped over that. I thought I talked about it at the very beginning. It's just sometimes this artist feels off to me compared to the color artists who I've so far liked the most from. I guess I think there may have been a difference in how much they were paid, maybe per story. Like some stories with the yellow and gray artist. The images look excellent. And in other stories, they're like, eh. Yeah. I also have to wonder how much of that perspective is the amount of yellow versus the amount of gray. This one is predominantly gray. You have some yellow in the first image for the leaves and a couple of the flowers. And then you have it for illustrating the light in the second image. And a little bit on the blanket and a little bit on the dumpling and basket in the bottom image. Hmm. But a lot of it is grayscale. So, yeah, of these three, the only one I really remember reading a lot is Dumpling. Hmm, story about animals. Can't imagine why I was reading that. Also, wow, these stories went by quick. I didn't even realize this was the third one. I kind of had a feeling, so like, we started out with a yellow and ink drawing, and we usually end with the same type. Yeah, it does seem to go back and forth because the next three it's color black and yellow color so they do seem to be pretty consistent about going back and forth between the types though there are some color variations later in the book if I recall correctly but in the earlier ones it's all back and forth between full color and the gray and yellow color scheme that obviously not the same artist as never asked for a YouTube bird but the same color scheme of having the grays and the yellows, no matter that they are pink apricots, or that it's a blue striped sweater. Mm -hmm. So this has been three more stories from my bedtime book of two minute stories. Today's stories were Dancing Pins by Rosemary Garland, The Grumpy Red Bus by Margaret Connor, and Dumpling the Cuddly Hedgehog by Anna Webb. If you enjoyed this, well, you're here at the outro. You may have enjoyed this, or you may just be listening to skewer us with your intellect in the comments of telling us everything we did wrong and everything grammatically and artistically wrong with the book. <laughs> hey, it could happen. Yeah, we kind of do that ourselves. <laughs> if you've enjoyed this, we've done quite a few of the two-minute stories that aren't actually two minutes. Um, there's a whole playlist going by now. Also, there's several other playlists based on author, story, type, etc. And then there's that really long playlist of all, mm, this would be 51 episodes of Ember's Reading Room. You know, just in case you ever have a case of insomnia and need a bunch of stories to help get to sleep. So, uh, last we checked, there's still quite a few copies of these on Amazon if you're interested. Also, the regular Amazon shopping links and the Ebates cashback for shopping links. Disclaimer, they don't sponsor us. They don't know we exist beyond the fact that occasionally they give us money when we have referrals. But uh, yeah, beyond that, they don't really know we exist. 
Thank you again for listening.